please pass your questions now over to the people who come down the aisle and collect them, and then we'll pose uh, as many as time will permit for Dr. Waltering to answer. And just as I said with Dr. Wolin, all the rest we will answer through uh, the Carson Art Foundation newsletter or online uh, as uh, a little time elapses, and all three of us will turn our attention to answering all the questions in that fashion. Keith? While some more are being collected, we'll start here. Um, What if you don't know or can't find a primary tumor? What should be done? Uh, well, you can only do what you can do. Uh, I mean, it sounds maybe a little bit facetious, but it, it is, it's true. Uh, probably 5% of the patients that come to me, we cannot, even after we do the, what I think is the optimal scan, which is the hand scan, you can talk about gallium 68, you can talk about uh, 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 carbon 11 HTP scans, but the most sensitive scan is, is being able to put the organ in your hand and feel it. You can feel one millimeter things as a trained surgeon. And still sometimes you don't find it. Then you deal with what you got. Uh, there's where sampling tissue really makes a difference that it gives you an idea about the proliferation rate. And yes, it is different than the primary, but it is what you have. And at that point, you have to deal with what you have today. Here's a very practical question and one that we are confronted with all the time. How do you get your oncologist to give the dose you require? I presume that's referring to octreotide or lanreotide and the Proper knowledge of this uh, answer is really not widely disseminated. Uh, first of all, I, I make sure that everybody that has any difficulty that, that let me fight the fight, don't you try to fight the fight, let me talk to your oncologist. I make sure that I send a copy. There are three peer-reviewed publications in pancreas which is the official journal of NANETS that all talk about this, this issue. What's the right dose? Uh, how, how does it make a difference? And I will share with your private physicians the results of our prospective trial, even though that I haven't got them published yet. But let me help you, uh, or, or get your Dr. Warner or Dr. Wallen to help you. Uh, there is a lot of information in the preclinical arena and in the clinical arena that, that should direct him uh, to making that choice. When all else fails, read the parable of the yellow Corvette. And that is, the guy goes to the, the Chevy dealer with 60 grand in his pocket. Wants to buy a yellow Corvette, the Chevy dealer says, I got a red Corvette, a blue Corvette, a gold Corvette, and a silver Corvette, and I'm too lazy to buy you or order you a yellow Corvette. What would any reasonable person do who wants a yellow Corvette? They go to the Chevy dealer four miles down the road. If you can't get your oncologist to help, maybe it's time for a new oncologist. Can you do angiogenesis or chemical sensitivity studying, testing on tumor tissue already preserved in a paraffin block? Uh, it's not preserved in a paraffin block, it's dead in a paraffin block. So uh, the oh, and I can't do it on frozen tissue. I can only do it on frozen tissue that was specifically cryopreserved. And and the way that is, have you ever seen the science fiction movies? They're really pretty damn close about those cryogenic kind of you know tubes. What we do is we chop up the tumor, we put it into DMSO, 
and tissue culture media, and then we have a, a special gizmo that drops it at one degree per minute until it's frozen, and then we transfer it and store it in liquid nitrogen. If you just drop a, a tumor in the freezer, it's dead. Here are two questions that ask the same thing about black raspberry powder. Uh, one says, uh, can it be used instead of uh, sandostatin or somatostatin LAR? And the other... I think the answer to that is no. Okay, the other one asks That's essentially... A, the the sandostatin is the standard of care. If you're not on sandostatin, you, you need to be doing knock-knock on the doctor's door and asking him why not. And, and Dr. Wallen and I were, were talking about this earlier. I mean, Dr. Ed is actually, believe it or not, more aggressive about using octreotide than I am. He said if he had somebody who had a liver met taken out and had no measurable tumor, he would use octreotide. And, and, and you know, I probably agree on a liver met. On, on just nodal mets and primaries, I, I don't do that. I think with this, this data coming out that, that's so, so strongly, I'll probably a, a, adopt a, a more aggressive attitude than I even had before. And I was slightly to the right of Genghis Khan and, and Attila the Hun. Here's uh, one question that's really several questions. Does a negative octreo scan typically suggest poorly differentiated tumor? No. What if the treatment implications of a what are the treatment implications of a poorly differentiated net? Uh, well, I may have to defer a little bit to Dr. Wallen because he's the medical oncologist who takes care of the more undifferentiated tumors. But in general, the, the undifferentiated tumors rapidly turn over. And because of that rapid turnover, targeted chemotherapy agents that aim at rapidly dividing cells are, are commonly used, i.e. chemotherapy works best on rapidly dividing cells. And that's why atypical tumors were always treated with chemotherapy, where the typical TYP, typical tumors that have low KI-67s that are very well differentiated were always thought not to respond to chemo. Dr. Warner and I have a paper out there that actually shows that maybe 25% of those will, even though they're poor or they're well differentiated, still respond. 70%, correct me if I'm wrong, Ed, but I, the number I carry around in my brain is if you have a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, they are bad news bears, and about 70% of them respond to chemotherapy. However, what gets you is that the duration or response of that chemotherapy may be a, a less than a year. Is that pretty pretty close? Dr. Wallen shaking his head yes, so I feel good about that one. That's not something in our group, Dr. Anthony's our medical oncologist, so most of the people with, with those undifferentiated tumors get treated by somebody else in our practice. Once you've had a positive lymph node, is there a greater risk for it to spread to other nodes or other parts of the body. Oh, absolutely right. If you have negative, let's say you have a primary ileal tumor with negative nodes, your chance of recurring at any point in your life is about 35%, and if you have uh, positive nodes, it's 65%. So having positive nodes is a bad news bear. Here's a very simple question which uh, uh, you've already answered, but it deserves answering again. Uh, can we take the blackberry powder on our own? In other words, does it have to be sure. prescribed? Sure, uh, and, and I think that, uh, again, that's something you can take as your own, but you're taking it then as a food supplement and, and not as an anti-cancer therapy. If we test your tumor and it makes sense, then the other group of people who seem to have a benefit and you can try a, a, try a few days dose. It's about $7 a day. This ain't cheap stuff. Uh, but those people who, with unremitting diarrhea that aren't completely controlled on octreotide, aren't completely controlled on, on uh, creon or pancreatic replacement enzymes, aren't completely controlled on chlor 
uh, or uh, chlorostyramine. Um, some of those people report really good results with black raspberry powder as, as a therapy just for diarrhea. But again, if you're gonna use it for an anti-cancer effect, think that we ought to test your tumor in the lab if we possibly can, unless you're just out of options. The questioner asks, where do they get it? Ah, they're, they're, and again, I am not a, a gonna give you which one is best. I only know of four sources in the United States. One is Stokes Berry Farm in Lancaster, Ohio. I know about them because that's where I get my black raspberries for my black raspberry pie every year. Um, there is a company that makes a powder. It's called Nutrafruit. I don't know where they are. There is a Sturm, S-T-R-U-M, berry farm in Oregon that sells quick-dried fruit. And the, most, the newest player on the block is a, called Berry Health, B-E-R-R-I Health, and they sell in bulk a, a powdered, freeze-dried black raspberry that has all the seeds out of it. Again, if you're an older person, you don't need a cup of black raspberry seeds a day to get in your diverticulum. That is not a good idea. A different question. How frequent should MRI be done, and uh, how frequently should an echo I presume meaning echocardiogram. Echocardiogram. Um, if you have a serotonin over a thousand, we echo you every year, and if you're symptomatic, every six months. If your serotonin's normal, your your syndrome is well controlled, then then once a year is fine for an echo, maybe every two years. MRIs we traditionally, because they have no radiation involved. We like to do them every six months. In, when, in, in the timing of when you're where you are in your disease makes a difference of how I do things. If you're six months out from surgery, you're at a higher risk of recurrence than if you're 10 years after surgery and you haven't had a recurrence in eight years. So the, the closer you are to an event, the more often I do scanning. So right out of the bat, let's say you had a cytoreductive procedure done at our institution January 1st. I would do biomarkers in three months, scans every six months, and, and the echo once a year. If you're two or three years out, then I'd probably do the blood, and, uh, blood biomarkers every six, urine every year, echo every year, and a CAT scan an MRI and an Octrea scan once a year, but I'd spray some three or four months apart. Two questions regarding lung carcinoids. Are they currently benefiting from the same advancements as, for example, for a stomach or carcinoid elsewhere? And secondly, is, is uh, somatostatin analog injection effective in preventing recurrence of lung carcinoid or what other pro uh, prophylactic treatment is there? I wish I could tell you. Um, you know, and, and like Ed, I, I, I guess, you know, you can do this for a long, long time and be, quote, an expert and still not know all the answers. I did not realize that in, in the Radiant 2 trial for, for RAD001, that lung cancers were sort of a, a thrown in there as a thing. Most of the time, I don't think you can, pair, can compare lung carcinoid to mid-gut carcinoid at all. I would love to be able to tell you that I knew for sure that octreotide worked in lung carcinoid. It makes a lot of sense. The biology is there. There has been, I mean, and the safety about using octreotide as compared to chemotherapy or something like that, makes good sense. I just don't have any data. Do you have any data that you know of, or Richard? I don't, I don't have any data that would say, if I had a lung carcinoid, that you should absolutely take octreotide. However, I would, if you told me that, that you wanted to know what I would do if I had it, I'd be on it. Yeah. 
I, uh, that, but I have zero, but I'll tell you when I have zero information. I mean, this is what they call a wag, wild, hairy, blank guess. Now, we've got a few more questions, but we don't have time for them. We'll answer them on.